Hello everyone and welcome to my language and history channel. My name is Irina. I am a historian as well as a language and history teacher and I am generally speaking interested in Germanic languages, Norse culture and mythology. If you share my interests please like and subscribe and help my channel grow. Uh, I would really really appreciate that. So um, today I'm going to comment on um, a topic which is I think very interesting. Um, about hell. Hell in Old Norse culture, so in Old Norse uh, mythology. So um, apparently I have a preference for this kind of, uh, of uh, topics. My, my very first video on this channel is actually something related to uh, German phrases uh, with uh, the devil. So if you're interested in that, I left a, a card in uh, the upper corner. Uh, feel free to click it later. All right, so um, I'm going to comment on hell both as a person and as a realm, uh, as the underworld or the realm of the dead. And for that, as usual, I am going to use the main two sources for um, this mythology. The first one being uh, the Poetic Edda, which is a collection of poems written in 1200. The poems, however, are uh, older than this. Um, they are about from the uh, 900, so we can consider it a primary source. And then we have the uh, Prose Edda, which is the version of the Icelandic chieftain and scholar uh, Snorri Sturluson, which can be regarded as a secondary source. It is nevertheless a very important source because he had, uh, he definitely had access to some materials um, which uh, got lost with the passage of times and he knew much more uh, than um, um, we could ever know, so it's good to use him as source nevertheless with uh, me measures of precaution. Yeah, so we need to corroborate what he says with uh, uh, the Poetic Edda. And um, I am actually going to start with uh, the references in uh, the Prose Edda because um, Snorri has um, a more, let's say, um, coherent way of telling things. Um, I mean by that the fact that he, he takes all these elements, um, all these traditions, narrative traditions um, about um, uh, North, uh, Norse myths, and he tries to make uh, make a very... Uh, organized and structured story uh, about them. But besides that, he often has details um, which might have been authentic and um, without his prose edda, we would have uh, no clue about them, actually. All right, so hell is, uh, according to Snorri's prose edda, according to the first section, which is called uh, Gylvaginning, so this is the deceiving of King uh, Gilvim. Um, Hel is the daughter uh, and one of the children of the god uh, Loki. Um, Loki, uh, the trickster god, sometimes the enemy of the gods, um, other times the helper of the gods, so a very complex uh, character. Um, Loki has with the giant woman Angerboda, uh, which is a very compelling name because it means a the bringer of grief, the bringer of sorrow. He has three monstrous children. Um, so he has the wolf Fenrir, uh, the wolf Fenrir, Fenrir who will uh, be uh, the arch enemy of the god Odin at uh, the Battle of Ragnarok. Um, then he has the world serpent Jormungand, uh, the world serpent uh, which uh, encircles um, the uh, world of men, Midgardr, lying in the um, outer um, ocean, which uh, Thor tries to fish. I also have a video about uh, that story, uh, linked in a card above. Um, the arch enemy of Thor. And then we have uh, Hel. Um, so when the gods realize that uh, these three children, Fenrir the wolf, Jormungand the serpent, and um, Hell, the goddess of the underworld, of death, um, are a danger to them. And when um, uh, the prophecy tells them that they are going to bring great mischief and disaster to the world, um, they decide to cast them away, to get rid of them. So um, they throw the world serpent, for example, into the deep sea. Um, and they uh, decide to bind Fenrir 
with a magic rope and they also decide to throw hell into um, in the prose edda the realm is called Nivelheimer. so um, Nivelheimer, we also have uh, this uh, term in the creation myth it was the watery foggy realm uh, at the beginning of the world However, it also has this sense sometimes of the underworld, either in the form of Nivelheimer or in the form of Nivelhell. So Snorri means here actually the underworld. He um, doesn't mean the this realm uh, which was at the beginning of the world. Um, or perhaps it was a contamination between two narrative traditions here with these two terms. Um, anyway. So um, she has uh, authority over this world and she um, has great mansions, so great halls, um, um, exceptional and big and yeah, um, very uh, impressive. Um, there are also some reference, references to the fact that it's a rather inhospitable place. Um, for example, her bed is called the sick bed um or her table is called uh famine or her um or hunger sorry hunger and her knife is called uh famine she's also described uh described physically as being half colorful or half colored as in living you can see that she's alive half of her and the other half is blue or black some translators uh, translated it uh, as uh, as black um, however, blue also makes a lot of sense because it's um, it's it's the color of uh, the yeah the dead like a corpse. She looks like a co a corpse, and she is really recognizable. So that's why she also uh, in in popular culture she is represented often as a um, um, half like split in half, and one half is uh, the living half, and the other half is the, the corpse half. Maybe it's not meant it like that. Uh, maybe not. That's a uh, uh, that's something for uh, for us to um, uh, to imagine. Um, all right, so this is hell, and like I said, hell is also the name of the realm. So the, the physical realm where you go after you die. Um, and we have a description uh, in Gilva in Gilvaginning as well, a description of the god Hermother, uh, allegedly a son of Odin who writes to hell on the Hellweger, so on the road to hell, um, in order to find out whether hell, the goddess, uh, would allow the god Baldr to come back into the world of the gods. I remind you that the god Baldr, uh, the most beautiful, the wisest and uh, brightest of the Asir, of the gods, um, was uh, murdered by his blind uh, brother um, by um, with the, the help of a trickery um, from the god um, Loki and he ended up in hell. And um, in this description, um, so after the, the uh, funeral of the god Baldr, um, uh, the gods and Baldr is put on a pyre and he's burnt with um, all his uh, attire, includes, um, his horse included, um, after this, the gods wonder if there is someone who would, uh, who would engage in such a quest uh, to go to hell and um, have this conversation with um, uh, the goddess hell. And Hermother does this. He rides for nine nights. Um, the number nine is very important in uh, Norse mythology. It's, it has a, um, a magical connotation. Um, and he reaches at some point a river called Gyol. <clears throat> uh, Gyol would mean something like shouting, yelling, so the, the yelling river, actually. All right, um, then uh, uh, he goes uh, on the bridge, he crosses the bridge over this uh, river, Gyol. Um, it's a fascinating bridge, uh, shiny and glowing with uh, gold. And uh, guarding the bridge uh, is a maiden called uh, Mothgudr. It uh, means something like bat battle, angry, um, angry warrior, something like that, something related to battle either way. Um, 
and she asks him what he's doing there so she she realizes that um um that um uh, he's not dead and uh, her mother replies that he wants to go and see uh, hell and this maiden uh, tells him that he needs to go downwards and northwards in order to find the road so you can see that there is a certain physicality associated with this in the sense that it is possible to actually reach this uh, realm it's it's not only another dimension it's also something that can be reached if you know the road um all right and her mother uh, does as she says she rides up to the hall and dismounts his horse uh, goes into the hall and uh, there he sees his brother balder on the seat of honor so it wasn't that bad for him actually um, and he begs Hel to let uh, Balder uh, come back and ride um, home with, uh, with him. Um, and uh, the goddess tells him that the only way to do that is um, if everything in this world would cry for the god Balder. Her mother then um, retrieves the uh, ring Draupnir, uh, which Odin puts on the pyre of his son. This is also a magic uh, object. It, it is that ring that um, uh, produces um, similar, uh, similar rings every ninth uh, night. Um, so he takes this ring as a, as a sign, as a token from, uh, from Balder from the underworld. Um, his wife Nana also gives... Um, um, her mother um, uh, a robe so that she uh, so that her mother can give it to Frigg to his mother to Baldur's mother um, and then her mother uh, comes back uh, home uh, it so happens that um, not all creatures uh, weep for Baldur the one who does not do that is you might guess it is um, Loki who takes the shape um, of um, giant uh, of a giant woman in a cave something like that um either way coming back to the topic um it's also interesting to notice the fact that when her mother uh talks to this uh, maiden who was guarding the bridge to hell uh, she tells him about some warriors some companies of warriors who were there before um which is pretty strange if uh, we take into account the fact that uh, Valhol should be um, the realm where warriors who fight in uh, who fight and die in battle go and hell is reserved for the ones who do not die in battle however it is very possible that um, at least at least at the beginning so in in older forms of mythology so in all the traditions of mythology um this was actually um a thing that every uh, warrior was subjected to i mean going to hell so this this idea with valhol as being this um um this uh, place um special place only for uh odin's warriors might be a later uh conception um, it, we have this possibility um, and this is actually also suggested by the term itself uh, the term hell um, because this comes from a word which meant something like to cover it's from an old um, in, older Indo-European root um, so cover cover what cover your body with the tomb with the burial mound um, so this would actually make sense, yeah, because you, you are in hell because you are in the grave. You are in hell because you have your, uh, your burial mound. Um, so maybe that was something that um, um, occurred. Um, maybe hell is just a, a, a general afterlife. And um, then we have this uh, tradition of, um, of Valhol. Um, Okay, um, there are also references in the Poetic Edda, obviously, uh, regarding, um, uh, regarding hell. 
Um, sometimes it's not very clear um, whether the goddess is meant or the place itself. Um, I think most probably the place is referred to in the Poetic Edda, although this uh, yeah, ambiguity might have been uh, more or less intentional. Um, so let's look at a couple of references here. So, for example, we have in the Voluspo, the poem about the uh, beginning and destruction of the world, uh, we have uh, in stanza 43, and um, uh, this stanza actually works as a some kind of refrain, so you will also find it uh, later in the same forms. Uh, we have uh, this detail about um, the fact that uh, three roosters are going to crow at the end uh, of the world at Ragnarok to let the gods know that um, um, this, um, these events are in motion. And uh, one of the roosters is in uh, hell. Um, he is not named. Um, so he is at Solum Heliar, so at the gates, the pillars of, uh, of hell. Then we also have um, in this landscape the wolf Garmer, um, who may, may or may not be the same as the wolf Fenrir. He howls from, uh, from a cave called Gnipa Helir. Um, and Helir actually is related to the word hell, the cave, so also something you, yeah, you, you cover or you, yeah, some, some place where you can hide. Um, so this would be the entrance to the world of the dead. Um, okay, then we have in another poem called uh, Vafthrudnismol. Uh, this is a conversation between uh, the god Odin and a very wise uh, giant. Um, we also have a reference this time to Nivelhel. Um, and it is called the realm beneath. So some, something, so you can, you can see that there is a reference uh, to the fact that it was actually something underground but there was a way of reaching it and uh, he says that it is the place where dead men dwell or interestingly in another poem uh, the journey of skirnir for skirnis this is a poem about a servant of the god um, Freyr, the god of fertility, who goes on a quest to woo a giantess, uh, Gerder, um, whom uh, Freyr wanted to marry. And in this whole wooing process, he ends up uh, threatening the giantess that she is going to end up uh, looking at the gates of hell. She is going to stand somewhere uh, on uh, an eagle's hill so this would be something like um you know the um the the edge of the world and from there she's going to be looking down uh, the gates of hell horva heliar til um now whether it was something far away a landscape far away or the actual underworld yeah it's um we can only imagine um, then we have the god Thor, who is constantly uh, threatening in different poems to send uh, giants to hell. Um, and uh, we also have some references in a poem called um, Alvismol. This is a poem, uh, this is a conversation between Thor and a dwarf. Um, and he sp often speaks about uh, the dwellers of hell. So the dwellers of hell. He's probably referring to the dead. It's not very clear. He might also be referring to the dwarves themselves. Yeah, d different. Uh, it's too vague so that we can um, really um, say something uh, for, uh, for certain. Um, all right, and probably the most compelling source from the poetic Edda, uh, we also have a description of a road to hell in the series of heroic poems in the Poetic Edda. So the Poetic Edda is grouped in two parts, the mythological poems and the heroic poems. So um, in the heroic poems, we have a poem called um, Hellreith Brynhildar. 
uh, Hellraith Brunhildar, it is the um, uh, road to hell of the famous Valkyrie um, Brunhildar. Um, now, for those of you who are not familiar with the um, uh, cycle of the Nibelungs or um, the cycle of the Volsungs, um, she is a Valkyrie uh, who gets uh, involved with the famous uh, Sigurd or Siegfried, uh, the dragon slayer. Um, and um, if you read the Volsunga saga, for example, um, you will find um, uh, in the story elements such as the fact that uh, uh, Siegfried, uh, Sigurd, sorry, um, saves her because she is cursed by the god uh, Odin to uh, uh, to, um, uh, to a life of imprisonment um, in a very tight armor and under, um, under some kind of shelter of shields and with a circle of fire around her uh, because she uh, neglect, neglects his orders of sending uh, a king um, to uh, Valhol and instead she chooses someone else. Um, and uh, after... Uh, after Sigurd saves her, um, they have an encounter and um, she tells him the secret of runes, for example, um, and they um, agree that they will be together. However, that doesn't happen because um, Sigurd ends up with um, the Burgundians and he is given a potion of forgetfulness and forgets about uh, Brunhilder and uh, in the end, he is convinced by uh, one of the Burgundian kings to uh, switch shapes with him and to go and conquer, uh, defeat in battle this uh, Valkyrie because she says she will marry only the one who will defeat her in, um, in battle. And because of this, to make the connection with this poem, uh, don't want to... Um, uh, don't want to drag on it too long. Um, so uh, because of this, she wants to uh, get her revenge on uh, Sigurd. Um, and the story goes, um, goes on very wrong because um, they both uh, end up dead. She actually kills herself after uh, Sigurd himself gets killed, also because of her machinations. Um, and after killing herself, she goes to hell, she is um, uh, burnt in a wagon, and she also takes this um, uh, Hellwecker. On the road, she also meets a giantess, just like, just like uh, her mother in the other myth, and uh, this giantess accuses her of having caused the death of Sigurd and of all the heroes in the story. And then... Brynhilde tries to make amends for her acts by telling that she was forced into a marriage um, and uh, punished to be imprisoned and so on. And um, she concludes with something that actually does not sound very Norse. I think there's a lot of Christian influence here because the poem itself is, um, uh, is a later one from the 11th century. So she says something like... Um, uh, everyone, um, everyone suffers in this world. The, the, we live in a world full, full of grief. But at least um, now she is together with uh, with uh, Sigurd. Um, all right. So as you can notice, we do have this idea that um, hell is a place that can be uh, reached. Um, we also have this idea that it may have referred to the afterlife in general. This is also supported by the fact that um, many times in the sagas, so in um, later sources, uh, in later Norse literature, um, it happens that warriors do not leave their burial mounds. And it also happens that sometimes, um, for some reason, they get angry and they start um, haunting uh, the people around. They go full uh, Evil Dead. Anyway, another video about this uh, zombie motif in the sagas. Um, so, um, yeah, we can speculate about um, when this separation between Hell and uh, Valhol uh, took place. Um, but it's interesting to notice, um, yeah, the, the fact that it is 
um, it is described very um, intricately um, with quite um, a lot of uh, details and it's not necessarily a place of punishment and for your sins and a place for uh, burning alive, you know, as in um, uh, Christian mythology. Um, speaking of punishment, um, it's also interesting that the Scandinavian and uh, Icelandic word for, uh, for hell is actually a compound word nowadays. So in Swedish we have, for example, helvete. So this is made up of, um, of hell and of a word which means punishment. So this is clearly uh, some, um, uh, some Christian influence. All right, so I hope you found this um, at least a little bit informative. Um, I will continue to make videos on similar topics. If you like my little, um, what shall I call them, lessons? Comments. If you like my little comments on the, this kind of topics, uh, please like and subscribe. Uh, and I thank you very much for watching and your support. Take care and see you next time. Bye-bye.